to the Unleash Success Podcast, where we break down the secrets of success to give you real tools and strategies that get real results. And now, here's your host, Corey Corpodian. All right, let's get ready to unleash success today. This is Corey Corpodian. I'm super excited to be interviewing Mr. Joe Williams today. He is the founder of the Creative Performance Group, which helps take successful people and turn them into amazing world-class communicators and speakers to help make an impact in their lives and their businesses. Joe originally was in the financial services industry, where he took his company public at the age of 26. Then he went and became a lead trainer and speaker for the Anthony Robbins companies. Joe has consulted with tons of different companies from aerospace to the military and the federal government, where he's helped create over $50 billion in new business. He's going to help us today by giving us amazing tools and strategies to become world-class communicators just like him. I'm super excited. Let's get ready. Welcome, Joe Williams. Welcome to the podcast, Joe. Thank you so much for coming on here today. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a, it's been an exciting trying to get you up here, and I'm super stoked about having you on here because as one of the uh, trainers for you know creating world class speakers, and at the same time being a world class speaker yourself, I've realized how important communication is, and this is exactly what I want you to share with us today. Um, and so. Before we get into really your backstory and how you became such a, um, an incredible speaker, I want to get to the meat of this because I think a lot of people on here aren't thinking, hey, I'm, I want to be a professional speaker. You know, I don't want to step on stage, but also educate everybody on why it's important just to be a powerful communicator. I really believe the master skill of leadership um, you know, if you're in any kind of leadership position whatsoever, you own a company, you lead a team, you uh, are a leader in your community, your your church, your civic organization, whatever it is, the person who can actually move others emotionally, stir something up so that they take a new path, they make a new decision, they see the world in a different way, and they make new decisions on what to do based on that, I think it's the master skill. Yeah, absolutely. Communication is so important, whether you're speaking in public or doing a business deal or even in your relationship at home. And Joe, you've talked to hundreds of thousands of people worldwide. Where did it all start for you? What began your speaking career? Um, it's actually kind of a funny story because I, I, I kind of fell into it when I was in my 20s. I, I started several companies. One of them we took public in 1996 when I was 26 years old. And immediately I knew it was a mistake. Uh, it took me about two years to kind of wind out of that business. And my daughter had just been born, actually, uh, first, first child. And I, so I was kind of taking a little bit of a hiatus. And a friend of mine, who was really big in the creativity training world, long story short, asked me to start doing workshops with him. And that's really how I started. And right around that time as well um, was the first time that Tony Robbins uh, called me and said, hey, we've got this event. Uh, we'd like you to do it. And uh, I never planned uh, to be a, a, a speaker. In fact, at that point still, I, I, I kind of hated speaking. And that kicked me over the edge, I guess. I don't know. Good way to good way to put it, I guess. Yeah, no, definitely. So you actually hated speaking at first. I did. What was the moment where you said, you know what, this is actually, I enjoy this. You know, it was probably sometime uh, during that year. I mean, in my mind, I have quit the business, quote unquote, like three times. I've thought, you know, there's easier ways to make money. You know, I, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna go back to starting companies and 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 doing that. And something inside me kept saying, you know, push forward. And uh, I did it the hard way, trial and error. You know, it was a it was a tough way to learn a skill like that. I didn't realize that in a couple of days of really really intensive good training, a person could find their strengths and own them. And so that's kind of the impetus to what I'm doing today. So 
when you started out speaking, because a lot of yep. people think about speaking and, you know, they see these big guys out there and you were one of them where you're speaking in front of thousands of people. Yep. How did you start? You know, did you really start with thousands of people or maybe was it 10, 20, maybe a couple hundred? Yeah, no, no, no. It was, it was, I mean, I, I'm, I, I think my very first official uh, presentation or talk that I gave event that I, that I led was maybe, I don't know, 20, 30 people. So then I went to the thousands and honestly, I've gone back to that world of 10, 20. Uh, I like the smaller crowds because they're more intimate. Um, you can have more one-on-one interaction with people. Yeah. Very interesting actually. And I think it's important to note for people, uh, you know, I, I started speaking in front of people and in the beginning I had, you know, five friends and, Oh, thanks for showing up guys. Yeah. Uh, right. 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 <laughs> um, and it, it's evolved to, you know, where I can consistently speak in front of anywhere from 50 to a hundred people. And I'm really enjoying that and building up, um, not quite at the thousands of people yet, but it's always a, a learning experience. And it's nice to hear somebody like you say, you know, you didn't start speaking with thousands of people. No, no, not at all. Not at all. I'm curious if you'd like to go into it just a little bit about your experience in speaking with Tony Robbins and, and doing kind of those, uh, those large events. Um, you know, what was your kind of your favorite time working there and how did that impact you in, in your, in your current speaking career right now? Well, you know, the mid two thousands were a really great time prior to the, uh, economy downturn obviously in 2008 and so you know 2005 6 7 that was a really golden era in the uh in the speaking business in general for a lot of reasons uh not just with with tone but you know with with a bunch of different companies that were doing events uh the marketplace has changed quite a bit I think the second part to your question was, what did I learn during that time? That's really where I probably honed my uh, voice skills and warm ups and daily rituals and things like that because I was doing so much of it to so many big crowds. And, uh, you know, I'm sure it's probably illegal in many countries. But uh, my goal at the end of, the, of events was always to incite a riot. <laughs> um, in a, in a, in a good way, you know what I mean? Like people were so jacked up, excited that they would just, in fact, one time it did happen. Uh, they attacked the stage and started tearing down all the, uh, you know, pipe and drape and, and, and throwing, you know, the plants that were around and, and so forth. It's like uh, a rock concert. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, I, uh, I liked, I liked, you know, I come from kind of that whole world of, uh, uh, you know, I had blue hair when I was 16 and rode a skateboard on a half pipe. And <laughs> I'm trying to picture you right now with blue hair and try to, it's just try to picture me with any hair. That's the- <laughs> <laughs> absolutely um, cool. So I, you know, one of the things that you said there, I really want to get into, but bef- before talking about your, you know, the habits and the rituals that you do yeah. to really um, step your game up right when you step on stage. Uh, I find that there's always something and whether we know it or not, but there's always kind of the, either a belief or something that limits us from taking action. So before we get into all the the amazing tools and strategies that you use kind of on a daily basis and what you teach people, um, yeah. I'm wondering what stopped you originally and then how'd you overcome that? Well, I, w- I would say what stopped me originally was fear. Um, I had extreme stage fright and to the point that I would be sick for days in advance uh, before I gave any kind of speech or, or gave a talk or a presentation, whatever you want to call it. And, uh, you know, what kicked me over the edge, honestly, was just gutting it out and doing it and doing it and doing it. And, you know, as you know, I have a ritual after every, I have a pre performance ritual, pre-presentation ritual. And then I have a post and the post is, uh, I take a, you know, my journal and draw kind of a T bar chart. If you can imagine that on one side, I write what worked, what do I want to keep doing? What, uh, what was good? 
about what I just did. And on the, on the other side, I write, okay, here's some ideas for improvement. Here's how I want to improve in the future. And I do that to this day, uh, basically after every day that I speak or even work with a client. That's a really great tool. And we've talked about that before, I know. Yes. And um, I just wonder if you can share, why do you choose to do it in that way? And it's it, it's interesting, the word choice you chose there. So, you know, what did you do good? And then what do you want to improve upon? Why did you choose that? Yeah. So to come to your point of the word choice, that is that is conscious. So it's what went well, what was good, what do I want to do more of? That's the first thing, because naturally as humans, what I find is most people, when they're done uh, giving a presentation, tend to kind of beat themselves up. Oh, I didn't do this right. I didn't do that right. I force myself to think about what I can replicate in the future that worked. And obviously at this point, it's gotten down to very, very minute um, uh, details of what I want to replicate in the future, as well as sometimes bad habits will tend to creep back in. I can tend to be an um-er if I'm not a little more careful. And so that's something I consistently work on. It reminds me of what to stay consistent on. And then the second part of how do I want to improve rather than what needs to be improved? Uh, it sounds like a small difference, but it makes all the difference in the world because I can only build on how I can improve in my strengths. I can't build on dwelling on what needs to be improved. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree with you a lot. Uh, and I find that how can we improve a, a, is a, a better way to it, ask that you, question. Yeah. You know, the other thing that I think it does is because I've, I've, I've done it both ways. I've seen it done both ways with the what and the how. The, the problem with the what can be that it causes a person to blame others for something that went wrong, a team member, uh, you know, something that was in the production, something that was in the back of the room. So, you know what I mean? Uh, I like to accept responsibility instead. I and love just, that. Yeah, yeah. When you say what went wrong, oh, the audio cut out or so-and-so's feed or this wasn't right because it's, it's a lot easier to blame instead of literally that and not what can i what can change but how can i improve how can i improve right. that's right totally that's takes right. responsibility i remember when we first started working together i used to say okay and write a lot right <laughs> so how can i improve it i find that one of the ways that i did it is instead of trying to say the word before i'm ready i just finish a sentence pause think for an extra second, which nobody really ever recognizes, and then say the words that I really want to say instead of just those filler words. Yep. 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 Silence is a, uh, a commodity that is very under appreciated. Absolutely. So the daily habits, you mentioned some daily habits that you do. Is yeah. there something that you do every day? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I... You know, it, it's not, I would, I would not say it's absolute every day by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but there's a Wayne Dyer, I don't know. I'm trying to think 15 years ago, 20 years ago, recorded a little meditation called meditations for manifesting. It's about 20 minutes long. It's an active meditation. So you actually make a sound during it. Uh, it's, it's widely available. You can get it on your phone. It's an app. And I've used that pretty consistently for about 15 years, especially on days where I'm speaking and my voice doesn't feel quite right. It's a great vocal warm up in addition to being an amazing manifestation tool. I really believe in using the unconscious as well as my conscious mind to accomplish things. So I'm not really a huge fan of just sitting back and trying to meditate my way to wealth, happiness, and success. <laughs> you got to get out and actually do something as well. But I like to incorporate both. 
So the ah meditation, the meditation for manifesting, Wayne Dyer's program, uh, is really what, I mean, that's that's probably the basis of my daily ritual. Uh, rebounders, uh, little, you know, mini trampolines, love them, um, use them as much as I can. And uh, then I would say the other thing is daily reading when I need to go back to it, uh, Course in Miracles. I've done, I don't know, six, seven, eight times, probably at least. That's awesome. And I just want to clarify too, that's the the Wayne Dyer. I've used that before, but it's ah, A-H, like the sound ah. Yes, the sound ah, as in, it's the sound of creation. So in every language, the sound of the creator always has an ah in it. So God, Allah. Buddha, Krishna, Ra, they all have the ah. Yeah, I've used it before, actually, a couple times. It's been probably a few months, actually, since I've really jumped into that. And yeah. I found it to be oddly calming. Yes, it is. That uh, breathing pattern actually does lower your blood pressure and is very, very, very calming as well. I never made the connection to the physiology aspect of yes. it. Yes. Yes. And absolutely, you know, it would absolutely totally calm your body. It does. Gives you focus for the day. Uh, in fact, I keep a pen and paper with me while I do it. And during some of the affirmations, I will make notes for the day of what I'm going to do and results I want to get and so forth. Fantastic. So what's your pregame, you know, in the locker room type of, <laughs> how do you get pumped up for a big engagement? Oh my gosh. Um, well, you know, out of, out of respect for your listeners, I can't say, uh, all of what gets said backstage right before we go on, <laughs> on for a big event, <laughs> uh, we're hitting each other, high-fiving, you know, you know, I like to really, really, uh, power up. So I use, uh, in the, in the, in the Tony Robbins world, we would call it a power move or something like that to get myself like powered up. And then uh, usually right before I walk out on stage, I'll then calm myself and say a quick little prayer, ask for grace to work through me, to be a vessel for transformation. Yeah. And that, that power move, actually, I, you know, I'm very heavily in, in the science based evidence and, yeah. and seeing if some of these things that, you know, anecdotally, we know absolutely 100% work, but at the same time to for someone to do this, if they don't believe it works, it, it sometimes it doesn't. And then to have evidence. So a Harvard business psychologist, Amy Cuddy, she yep. released a study about power moves and how it actually increased yep. testosterone, decreased the cortisol, yep. which is the stress hormone. And yep. um, people were more likely to focus on the reward, which, man, I read this and I was blown away. I'm like, yes, science is actually working like now we we can prove that everything we know was working it, it when we could show it to people here here's yep. a study um in fact i've got amy's book right here presence right beside me on my uh my bookshelf Fantastic. Um, and uh yeah absolutely 100 percent, man i hear how much you uh, are aware of your own body and of what's going on with yourself do you ever use this on stage absolutely i uh, my goodness, um, 99% of the time that I'm on stage, I am, I'm, I'm checking in not only with what I had, you know, planned with my, <laughs> with my first brain, I'm checking in with where's my gut, where's my heart, where's what, what am I feeling while I'm doing this? Uh, that did not come easily. I can tell you that much. You know, for years, I was the guy who would get done talking and not remember a person that had been in the crowd. It's, uh, it's, I've been blessed with the ability to get to the point that even in a room of, you know, a thousand people, if one person is a little out of whack, I can feel it. I can see it. I can, I can respond to it. You know, I mentioned I started out in, in uh, creativity training. When I started speaking, I tried to treat, teach four-star generals one time uh, creativity. 
And uh, that, let's just say that did not go over very well. <laughs> oh. It was uh, it was uh, uh, kind of a bloodbath. I, I, I believe they, as I recall, they asked me to leave and I got some of the worst uh, reviews of any any uh, presenter of the uh, weekend. So, yeah, you, you've got to also judge your crowd and know who you're talking to first and foremost and 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 speak to them as individuals, not at the group. What you just said rings true to uh, an experience I just had. I just went down to Camp Pendleton and spoke for um, a company of Marines. It's hot. It was so hot. The AC had been broken for weeks. A summer <laughs> day in San Diego, inland, just enough where there's no wind. And we're all sweating. And I'm sitting there going, oh, my God. Like, how am I supposed to even win these guys over at all? And yeah. it took about... 15 minutes of kind of jumping in and really uh, struggling a little bit. And sometimes what we do is yep. harder to kind of break in, just like you with your, with your generals to talk to them, you know, maybe they weren't in, in, in complete agreement with you. And so I wonder how, what are some tools they use to really quickly build rapport with your audience? Okay. Um, that's a great question. Here's here's the deal. For years and years as well, I also did a lot of presentation skills, uh, for lack of a better term, training in aerospace companies. So Boeing, Lockheed, uh, Raytheon, Northrop, companies like that, helping them win really high stakes proposals. So I was dealing with engineers and ex-military um, and I have incredible, incredible respect first and foremost for those people. That's, I think, as you do, um, you know, that's, that's the basis. Absolutely. Uh, number one, as quickly as possible, I have people share what they would like to get out of the time that we are together. So in many cases, they don't want to be there. They have to be there. They were mandated. They were told they had to be there. So, I really like to say, acknowledge that and say, you know, I know we all have places that we arguably could or should be, <laughs> you know, today. Yet the executive team has decided that we're going to spend this next uh, eight hours together. So since we're here, what would you like to have at the end of the day? And I actually have usually, in most cases, if the crowd is not too too large, I have people, number one, share with the person next to them. And then number two, I'll take shares from the audience. Many starting out speakers, people who are just starting out, uh, new speakers, go straight to the crowd for answers to questions and engagement and things like that. The problem is, and, and, and they get no let me finish that sentence. They get no response. The problem is they haven't greased the wheels, so to speak. So mm -hmm. I have people share with the person next to them first. And what you'll find is your engagement then from the crowd goes up exponentially. And having a person state, even if it's just to the person next to them, you know, their, their, their friend, what they would like to get out of the time starts the process of buy-in, starts the process of engagement. So do you introduce yourself, spend a few minutes kind of giving your background, or how do you transition into that, that ask? I normally have a very, very short pre-prepared uh, introduction that I'll give to I like it to be whatever the uh, you know the leadership person person is on that team. So it might be the project manager, it might be the uh, uh, VP, it might be the the CEO, whatever it is. I'll I'll actually have them say a few words as as way of introduction. So I'm not standing up there and talking about myself. I much prefer to talk about them, not me. If that makes sense. Totally. And I actually had to learn that the hard way when yeah. I did that talk. I was like, oh, <laughs> whoops. <laughs> Drop the ball on that a little. Shoot, so. shoot me your info stuff or your intro stuff, I should say. I'll uh I'll uh I'll I'll take a look at it and give you some give you some feedback. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate that. And I just one sure. of the times that I, I didn't give someone an intro and I'm learning that you really should 
and for everybody who's getting into speaking, have a small intro prepared yeah. and actually give it to them because as much as they know you as well as they might know you or not know you, it's easier for them because they're not the speaker. They're not the in person engaging the audience. It's easier for them to just read a, a paper because they'll forget half the stuff. You know, even if they're best friends with you, they just kind of, they miss out on certain key points you'd want to express in a very, uh, in an intro and carry a hard copy day of that's, uh, that's, that's vitally important. That's Don't just advice. email it and hope they, they have it, but, uh, supply them and very short one, one paragraph at the most. And when you're sitting there getting ready, I feel that even I now still get some, some stage fright, you know, where I'm just a little bit nervous and I equivalent a little bit to the, to butterflies before I used to play sports in high school before a big game or the tip off or the kickoff. And I somehow, I, I get really excited about it a little bit. And when I walk onto the stage, it's just a transformation where I'm just ready to go. And maybe because I've always done some speaking growing up, I never experienced a, a significant amount of stage fright. Granted, when I was talking in front of a bunch of people in the military, I definitely was getting worked up. Uh, so I, I kind of have, I just have ways to deal with it. How do you deal with stage fright? And for someone, especially if you're like, you know, crippled by stage fright where you physically can't even move, you were saying you got physically sick. What, what do you tell, what do you tell yourself or, you know, your clients? Well, first and foremost, I embrace those nerves, uh, that nervousness, that anxiety, that fear, that whatever you want to call it. I, I I learned years ago to just embrace that and use it, channel it, just like you said. And what I found is watching others, those that don't have it, who pride themselves on, oh, I don't have any fear at all. I just get up and talk. I don't have any, you know, it doesn't bother me at all, uh, tend to get caught off guard. They tend to, at some point, come off as a cardinal sin, arrogant, cocky, mm. um, overconfident, and that is the one thing your audience will not stand for. You can say, um, you can say right, you can say whatever, <laughs> you know what I mean? You, you can have those little, little idiosyncrasies are fine, but arrogance, overconfidence, cockiness. Uh, superiority. That is what an audience will not take. So I embrace the stage fright. I think the most important thing though, as a tip is breathe, breathe air. It's what your body most needs and uh, do something to try to relax the, the micro tension within the muscles. Um, you know, that's kind of what shuts a lot of people down is lack of breath and, they don't even realize they're not breathing deeply enough and getting the oxygen their body needs. And then they also are tensing even on an unconscious level. They're kind of almost micro muscles and, uh, the, the brain starts to release, as you said, you know, releases cortisol and, and adrenaline and everything else. Cause it's now fight or flight. And that's really what uh, stage fright is. It's a fight or flight response. Very, you know, it's funny you say that because I'm not sure if it's above, but next to death, people are most afraid of public speaking. Yeah. I, I, you know, I think it goes back and forth. I've seen studies both ways, but yeah, exactly. Exactly. And it, it, you know, it doesn't have to be, I think one of the reasons that they're concerned about it is they think they need to be a different way than they are. And the truth is, you know, who you are is more powerful than anything you could ever be on stage, if that makes sense. I know when I was starting out and it was an interesting transition that I really didn't even think about. So you just said it, but sometimes on stage, I would suddenly lose my maybe place in what I was talking about. Yeah. And I would have a moment, an internal moment of freaking out. Like, yeah. oh, what am I going to do right now? And it would actually, it would hurt my connection with my audience. And I struggled with that a little bit and I didn't even realize it, but it's because I don't ever think about how I look or 
what I say, and I have said some crazy stuff in front of people where even my girlfriend's like, I can't believe you said that. And I said, was it effective? <laughs> and she said, yes, because my goal is I'll say anything if it serves a purpose. Yep. And I'm always yep. trying to serve the audience. And I never even, I never even thought about it. So you just said that, but sometimes that, that moment of stage fright on stage, right? So you're battling stage fright before I practice my breathing. I'm very calm, sort of, I'm actually pretty, probably pretty stressed until I start walking towards the stage, but yep. you know, practice the breathing. But sometimes you get that stage fright in the middle of the talk. Yep. What else can you do if, and there's actually a, a, a cool trick you told me um, during our training and I can't remember the name of it, but it was the little note in your pocket. Yeah. Yeah. I, I call it a Linus's blanket. So if you remember Charlie Brown, there was Linus. He yes. carried his blanket everywhere and he freaked out if he didn't have it. It didn't really do him. It, it, you know, it didn't serve a purpose. It didn't do him any good. It, you know, they would occasionally kind of make fun where he would snap it at things and things like that. But in other words, that it was just this thing that made him feel safe and comfortable. I really like to find for each person I train, uh, each person I work with, what is their Linus's blanket when they're in front of the room? So it might be a note card in the pocket. You may never use it, but you know you have it. It might be the way notes are set up on a podium or, uh, you know, in the, in the advanced stages with large crowds, we use what we call stage signs and they are, um, just bullet points that are, you know, usually on the stage taped down that we can just glance down and we know they're there. We don't really ever use them necessarily, but we know they're there. So it's kind of like Linus and his blanket. And the note card is definitely that. And I will tell you, I use that. And one thing that I did recently was I did a talk and the Linus's blanket that I had was a PowerPoint presentation. And I did have a physical note packet, but that was more for the participants. Right. Be and thank God I had that packet because the PowerPoint projector, they, it wasn't working. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, no, yep. that was my yep. direction. Yep. <laughs> and, and so I had to jump in there, but it actually created a lot more engagement. You know, there was a few fumbles. Yep. And so in the middle of that, I, I really love that, that quick tool, just to, even if you don't, you don't always need it, but if you do, you have it and it helps you just kind of keep things smooth. Absolutely. Always. If you're using PowerPoint, always, 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 always have a hard copy with you because what you experienced of the projector not working or a, bu a bulb, you know, blowing out halfway through or whatever, you've got something that you can work off of. So good job, man. Yeah. I was very lucky that I had that in, it was not planned the first time. <laughs> it will be planned next time. <laughs> good, good, good. Always, 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 always just remember that <laughs> have yes. a hard copy. Absolutely. So I'm curious is what are some of the common mistakes that you see speakers make? And I'm not talking about the ums. A lot yeah. of people do that, but what are the, some of the common mistakes that you see people make that are kind of an easy fix and, and but really could sabotage their entire presentation? Well, I, I, I would say first and foremost, by for sure, by far, is trying to be someone other than they are off stage. There's a common misconception with presentations that a person should be uh, almost like an actor who goes into character when they get on stage. I think that's a mistake. I think, as I said, who you are is more powerful than who you try to be. <laughs> And so first and foremost, I would say trying to be someone other than you are walking around day to day is, uh, that's, that's probably the single biggest mistake that's easily fixable. Um, you know, as well, easily fixable, I say, but yet some people don't want to embrace and own 
uh, who they are. Uh, instead, they're kind of running around wearing a mask. Um, so that has to be kind of, you know, torn, torn down a bit and they, and they need to really embrace and this is um, why their strengths. Yeah. That tool right there. And this is why you're not just a, a master of public speaking, you're a master of communication and that right there, you know, so many people walk around with this mask, trying to be someone who they're not at yep. work, at home, in a relationship, whatever it is, they, they lack that ability to authentically communicate what they're feeling or, you know, who they are. And yep. you just nailed it right there where, why, even if I'm not trying to be a public speaker, how come mastering the art of communication is so important? Yeah. I mean, oh my gosh, being real, being yourself, owning and embracing your strengths and your little, as I said, little, little rough edges in some cases. I mean, if you're standing in front of a room and you're rocking back and forth, jingling the change in your pockets, you know, we can, we can work that out. You know, we can, we can help you stop that. But the only real mistake I think a person can make, um, is, as I said, kind of overconfidence, cockiness, arrogance, putting on airs, uh, for lack of a better term, putting on a mask that makes them seem like they are better than, or they are above their audience. That's going to be unforgivable by, by your audience. I think the only mistakes are things that cause breaks in connection mm. with an audience with not, let me be more specific with individuals. Cause you're not talking at an audience you're having a conversation with the individuals that have graced you with their time and their money and their attention. And so have a one-on-one -on -one conversation, even if it's in a room of a thousand, get in there. And, you know, as you talked about earlier, eyes are the window to the soul. So get, you know, connect deeply through the eyes with eye contact and have a conversation with the humans that are there with their their time and attention. So not you. to not to look at the entire forest, but at the individual trees and really give you them got some it. focus. Yeah, yeah, you got it. You got it. So as you master the art of communication, and actually, sorry, I want to go back to that. Sometimes people, especially people who are not so extrovert uh, yeah. and more introvert, yeah, might come across as in that way of overconfidence. What's one of the first things you do to kind of jolt them out of that uh, stance or state and help them transition into a a better present, a better presenter, better public speaker, better communicator? Well, you know, first first of all, I don't necessarily think there's a correlation between introvert extrovert the, uh, that whole thing here in, in this equation. Uh, in fact, I find that many of the best speakers that I've ever worked with and myself included are tend to be quiet people off the stage tend to be very, uh, you know, somewhat introverted yet, uh, to your question, the best way to help someone who is putting on a mask of, um, uh, you know, oh, I just, I, I, I got this. I, I don't, I don't get nervous at all. I, I have no problem speaking in front of groups. Um, that's usually a defensive mechanism. It's either going to be a, if you think about, you know, a castle with walls around it, it's either going to be a large wall or it's going to be a small wall. It's either going to be like a, you know, Game of Thrones, <laughs> <laughs> giant, giant wall, or it's going to be one that, that can be come down pretty easily. Rarely have I run up against um, someone as a client who had a, uh, you know, a, a giant wall. Uh, when that happens, extreme tactics are necessary. Um, and I, I'll just, I guess, leave it at that. <laughs> sounds sounds <laughs> uh, good. You, yeah. you, you got to kind of tear, you got to tear that wall down and you, you got to help them get in touch with who they are. And, and love who you are and cherish and own, accept, uh, uh, embrace who you are. And 
once you tear that wall down, that's a pretty short path then usually to getting them to that, uh, that place to, to, to love and accept themselves. When you were just saying that right there, it actually kind of sounded almost like steps in a progression. And I was curious to, to know, is there a, a formula to becoming a master communicator and a better oh public speaker? Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah, there, there, there probably is. Each individual is different. Um, you know, it's usually a, a version of first and foremost, uh, what I do is take a look at what are some of the rough edges that are causing breaks in connection with their audience, with the individuals they're speaking with. And I'll try to, I'll try to, you know, shave those off first, but I've always got an eye toward what do they want? What should they do more of? What are their strengths? What are their unique talents, abilities, skills, what makes them uniquely the best? You know, I, I heard a quote years ago from, uh, I think it was Jerry Garcia of the, the Grateful Dead. I'm not a giant Grateful Dead fan, but this quote stuck with me. And that was, don't be the best in the world at what you do. I'm paraphrasing. Don't be the best in the world at what you do. Be the only one who does what you do. And so what I'm always looking for with people is what would make them the only one able to do what they can do. And we build from there. I love so that. So it's, 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 it's not really an answer to your question. I apologize, but uh, it, that's kind of the progression, you know, shave off some of the obvious things that might be holding them back and then have them own what makes them the only one. It's funny, you're saying you didn't answer the question, although in my head, the way my mind works, I'm sitting there thinking, okay, first you got to own you yep. and you got to be yourself. Don't try to be anybody else. Yep. You know, second, we can, we can take away all the little rough edges yep. and then third, finding yep. that, that uniqueness about yourself. And, and, uh, I think that it's interesting because a lot of people in their head go, you know, everybody's doing this right now. Everybody's speaking. Everybody's talking about what I want to do. And I look at that as a good thing. I, I, I think competition is a good thing. I think it means that there's a, a marketplace for what you want to do already established, but yeah. at the same time, you've never done it. And because you've never done it, you've lived a different life. You've got a different story. You've had different experiences and you're going to connect with people differently because of that. Yep. Yep. Completely agreed. Absolutely. hundred percent, hundred percent. Fantastic. So, you know, these, these last couple of questions I, I put down, um, before we just go into some, you know, just quick rapid fire ones, uh, sure. are, are really actually for, for me a little bit <laughs> selfish. I'm just curious to know, um, you know, I've been speaking now for a while and I really enjoy it. And I'm just wondering if there are people who already do speaking or already do presentations, what are some actions or some tools that we might be able to, to take to even better our ability? Oh, that's a great question. Okay. First and foremost, video yourself often and watch yourself back freshly as though you're just starting out. Uh, it's one of the best self-feedback tools there is. You can tell what you need to change. You can, uh, it'll affect every area of your life. Yeah. You know, I mean, you, you know, I, this is not a, <laughs> not something I, 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 I talk about a lot publicly, but as you know, I've, I've lost, you know, an enormous amount of weight in the last eight months. And, um, congratulations, by the from way, seeing, yeah, from seeing myself back on video, oh. I thought, you know what, this is not who I am. And so 65, 70 pounds came off because of video. Um, I wasn't consciously trying even. It just uh, was something that started shaping my subconscious uh, decisions on a day-to-day -day basis. So uh, I think video uh, as an ongoing tool is, is, is front and center. I think having people who are friendly feedback <laughs> mechanisms for you. So in other words, they're not out to tell you everything they did, you know, you did wrong yet. They're there to be straight with you. Be that 
a coworker, a friend, a spouse, or a, you know, a stranger that you trust, that their feedback is non-biased. It, it's, it's, it's not coming from any place where they have an ax to grind with you, or there's an upset, or there's a, there's a fondness. Uh, it's just very, very matter of fact type feedback. Um, this, this one's a little more difficult to find in, in a lot of cases. That's definitely, one of the things, <laughs> yeah. People, one of the things, as you know, I try to, I try to, you know, give my clients is, is, is be straight yet be on their side and looking for what they should do more of what they should build upon. We can only build on our successes. We can't build on our failures. People miss that in this arena. Uh, so we've got to look at what are we doing well? That's why we started there. And um, and then any rough edges, those can just kind of begin to fall away, especially when you see yourself back on video. And I can attest to you, and I remember we were working together, and you always, first and foremost, looked for what was good or even great about that. And that's what you always led with. Yep. And that definitely helps build the strength. It's just, you know, it's interesting because I, I, the way our brains work, we're always looking for what's wrong and not a lot of people do that. And I, I'm getting, I'm guessing that you probably, you did it for yourself and that's why you've been so successful as well. And when you do it for people you're training, I found that it was absolutely incredible um, just to keep moving forward and building on those successes. Absolutely. Absolutely. They're, they're the, 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 the foundation. And it's interesting you said record yourself. So I do record every talk that I do and I edit it and look back at it. But recently I've been, I made a commitment when I was interviewing another podcast, a uh, great interview, and she talked about doing Facebook live videos. Yep. Nothing crazy, but just something simple. I committed to doing one a week, two weeks ago, <laughs> and I have, you know, I do it for one minute, two minutes, maybe five at the most, but I sit there and I watch my own video and I think to myself, a lot of times it's not planned. It's not this big talk that I was trying to, you know, give. So my flow sometimes goes in and out and already I've just seen some things where I say, you know what, I need to improve on that. I need to improve on that. And actually, one of the things I, I would like to do when I do those videos is just have like a small game plan. Like, hey, let's talk about these three points in this video instead of just kind of winging it, which is what I did for the first two times. Yeah. I mean, I think for a Facebook Live, for the amount of time that you're talking about, even three things is probably too much. Just just have one idea. Uh, you know, any good, really good TED Talk, for instance is at 15, 18 minutes, 12 minutes, depending on what environment you give it in, TED, TEDx, whatever, is one idea worth sharing. And even for, you know, for Facebook Lives, I think, I think one, one, one big idea worth sharing is enough to fill your time there. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, nowadays with smartphones, anybody who wants to be a speaker can easily just absolutely. grab their smartphone, record themselves. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Even post it and, and post the progress or just record it for themselves to learn and improve. Yep. I think that's an excellent tool. And uh, I don't know, would you say that's probably the best strategy you have for just kind of improving your speaking ability? Or is there anything else that you might throw out any more value that you could possibly add? I mean, I know we've gone over so much of this entire interview. It's been amazing. Um, is there anything else that you use kind of on a consistent basis that somebody might be able to go pick up or I'll usually have, if I'm going to record a video, I'll usually have, uh, some notes, uh, on a large piece of like easel flip chart paper. Um, I'm kind of old school enough that I still like using that instead of a white, you know, a, a dry erase board only because it allows the freedom to flip back and forth between what I've said in the past and refer to it if I need to. Um, but normally, uh, yeah, for any sort of relatively short, you know, four or five, you know, six, whatever minute video of some kind, I will have, you know, I'll have notes written out large, uh, in the background where obviously the viewer can't see them, um, you know, in front of me, off to the side, or I'll have them already uh, written out on the on the board that's beside me for the video, 
And um, it's kind of my Linus's blanket. I love it. Fantastic. Um, I'm just curious, what does the word success mean to you? Hmm. Happiness, peace, fulfillment, tranquility uh, in oneself. That's what it means to me. Fantastic. Do you, you've been incredibly successful throughout your life at 26 years old, you know, going public, talking about doing billion dollar deals with Boeing and Lockheed and, and being a, an incredible international don't, public speaker. Don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. I have had more failures by far than I have successes. Those are, those are just what we talked about. Right. right. But, uh, you know, uh, uh, you're going to have your, you know, you're, you're, you're probably going to fumble the ball eight times out of 10. You're going to, you know, something's not going to work out right. Uh, I just tend to take so much, much action that, uh, that I get lucky every now and then, huh? It seems like it. And you know, the, that reminds me of the quote that, um, luck is when preparation meets opportunity. Yep. 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 It sounds like you've been well-prepared. <laughs> I try to be. And for sure. that was the highlight reel, but I'm glad you mentioned that because it's so true that we do, we do fumble and we do fail. Yes. Uh, if you get into that spot, uh, where you're fumbling, it sounds, you just take more action, but is there anything specifically that you do or you just, you write down a game plan and you execute? Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm constantly, uh, making notes. I I've, I've carried for years and years, uh, you know, from, you know, our time together, uh, I carry a little, you know, Moleskina, mm-hmm. uh, notebook in my pocket with a pen at all times. Um, I've actually moved over to even smaller one, uh, because I, I literally carry it when I'm taking, you know, we're taking the dog for a walk. I'll carry this thing because I am constantly making notes of what little adjustments, little changes, little things that need to happen. I'm constantly testing. One of my first mentors, uh, it was not Tony, it was someone before that, uh, taught me a quote that has served me well throughout life. And that is, more is always learned through movement than through meditation. So in other words, you learn more from doing and failing and then sometimes succeeding than you ever will from sitting around thinking about it. And, um, that's kind of been a lifelong mantra of, you know, movement, 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 not meditation. Get me wrong. The term meditation, uh, was just his way of saying it. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of meditating (laughs) meditation in the normal sense of the word. Right. I think in that quote, it was meant to be instead of thinking about the problem, just take action. Correct. Yes. Uh, Is there a book that you would most recommend to people about speaking or maybe just in general? Yeah. Yeah. You are the message. And, uh, you know, it's obviously its author is a little controversial now. Um, And it's Roger Ailes who was with uh, Fox news for a, a period of time. And, um, you know, uh, I, I still think it's the, the best book on the subject that's ever been written. There's, there's a lot. Yeah. There's a lot out there. I kind of have them all and I've gone through them. I'm not a big fan of the whole, you know, speaking is nothing more than storytelling mm-hmm. model. I know there's quite a few books on that. I'm a huge fan of being a, a great storyteller and using stories, as you know, having a story file and so forth. But you've got to bring more to the table than just being a storyteller to be a great speaker. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, uh, what would you say for the next question, actually, is perfect, sure. is a commonality between some of the greatest speakers you've seen or something that you look for in a great speaker? Hmm. Well, I would say the greatest speakers I've ever known there was a humility uh, on stage and more importantly, off stage. I had a, a gentleman who I've worked with a bunch of times. Uh, he's a, a, I wouldn't necessarily call him a friend, uh, although I would like to. <laughs> I have incredible <laughs> respect for him. I would call him a, 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 you know, a close acquaintance who's a number one best-selling author of, I, I think, 12 or 15 different books. Um, wow. incredible guy, 
unbelievable guy. I won't mention his name. Um, but you know, we were working together one time and he said to me, you know, Joe, as we watched another speaker who was on stage, who was kind of arrogant and, and cocky with the audience, he turned to me and he said, you know, it's how you treat somebody at 5 a.m. in the morning when you're in Des Moines for a radio show, that, that person that brings you coffee at 5 a.m., how you treat them is a reflection of who you are as a human. And so I think that level of humility, of gratitude, of, of realness uh, is a common trait that I've seen in the best speakers that I've ever worked with. Uh, is it in all of them? By no means. Uh, in fact, it's in, it's in maybe one out of 20 uh, wow. that I've worked with over the years. And so I, I you know, I, I strive for that myself, man. Absolutely. I do too. And it's, you always want to be just as, as honest and forthcoming as possible and, and real. And, you know, I love that, the gratitude. In fact, one of the things that I, I probably do every time, actually, when I'm talking to people is I, uh, somewhere in the first minute or two, probably just thank them for allowing me to be there. Yeah. 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 I, I mean, you know, you were asking me earlier about kind of an order or a, uh, 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 steps and so forth. I, I kind of took that for granted. Yes, you are exactly right with realness, with honesty, not some fakey, fakey little line, you know, that you dream up, but just like you said, being grateful, thanking the humans that are there for their time and attention. I mean, as we sit here, you know, 2017, uh, you know, going on 2018 here, uh, you know, having people's time and attention in a live environment or video live is more valuable now and more sacred now than it's ever been. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree with you. So um, I'm curious to know, are there any new ideas that you're experimenting with right now as far as speaking or honing in your skills? I grew up in the live event world, meaning having people come to a live event that now that will still continue, but, uh, we are experimenting more with, uh, with live casting different forms of, uh, you know, you were talking about Facebook live. That's one, that's one way to do it. Uh, I'm looking for longer segmentation. So, um, tools like zoom, uh, things like that. We're using quite a lot. We've been using them for a while, but we're using them quite a lot to do um, live cast events yeah, where that's... people don't have to travel, yet they are participating live as though they were actually there. Now, it's been obviously, it's been played around with for years, uh, but usually in a sales environment, not necessarily a, uh, a, a content delivery environment and a transformational environment. And so I'm, I'm right now really playing around with how to bridge that gap because the one thing you can't control, you know, when you're not with a person live is the environment in which they are viewing. So, you know, maybe the dog is barking, the kids are running around, whatever the case, you know, you've got to take all of that into account. So I'm, uh, I'm trying to play around with different ways to, to more hone and control that environment. Yeah, that sounds like a challenge. And and is there any tool that you're finding that you know really captivates people to engage them over this live cast? Yeah, I mean, uh, there's a few. Uh, again, I I really like the platform of Zoom. Uh, that way, I could actually see the people that I'm I'm working with. Oh. Um, you know, you can you can have little seminar rooms, you can have breakout rooms, all kinds of things on Zoom, and you can actually see the people. And, um, I'll usually have them commit to where they're going to be, you know, full attention notes, everything else in advance. And then I'm watching like a hawk as (laughs) I'm doing the presentation or, you know, doing the training or whatever it is. Um, I'm watching to, to, and I'll, I'll call people out. Um, I had, it's, it's really, I mean, I've had everything from people laying in bed, because it was, you know, the middle of the night in Australia when I did a presentation there, they show up and they're, 
screen is glowing and it's obvious they're laying back in bed to, um, you know, sitting there in their armchair with a large glass of scotch, (laughs) you know, I mean, I'll just, (laughs) I'll, I'll, I'll usually call people out on, on things like that. So, so having them being, uh, active in, in the process, uh, for live casting, I think is vital. I like that you recommend or ask them to even write things down or take notes because that immediately force, they can't lay down in bed. They have to actually sit up, they get engaged. They physically get engaged Yep. I think that's a great idea. So to wrap this up, I want to just talk about that action that people to, you know, what are some actions people can do to start speaking more right now? And before we do that, that one tool that I was reminded of when you're talking about the whiteboard, and this was something that I had actually never used before until we started working together. And I now use for every single one of my talks. And I think it's so valuable. Uh, and it's the, the sticky notes, the, uh, yeah. Yeah. So post it, post it notes. Yeah. That's what it is. Yes. So can you elaborate on your your strategy for that post-it note uh, board? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, the thing I love about using that as a as a as a mapping tool is just one idea, one thought, one thing that could happen. It doesn't have to be uh, in order. I will, as you recall, I'll put one idea, one main point, and I'll just write in no specific order, slap them on anything from a wall to a window to whatever, (laughs) and then go back and arrange them in order uh, into kind of, you know, what what in uh, the cartoon world they call a storyboard, and, and obviously in the movie world, uh, everything is always storyboarded out. I'll put it into the form of like a storyboard, um, meaning I'll put the post-its then into an order that would make sense, main points, stories, visuals, everything. And then I've got kind of a working model uh, for anything that I'm going to do. A cu- couple of years ago, I was doing a brand new training and I was just, I was, I was been beating my head against the wall to pull this thing out of myself. And finally, my incredible wife brought in a, had a post-it notes, threw them down and said, why don't you do what you teach? (laughs) And within 30 minutes, I had a full outline for a complete, you know, three day training. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's the go-to for me for sure. Absolutely. And I love that, you know, sometimes it's so hard to, uh, organize your, your yeah. speech. And so just by writing it all down, now you have it all down. And the beautiful thing about those sticky notes and post-it notes is that change the order. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> They're instant. <laughs> so yep. Joe, if somebody wants to um, get started into actually speaking, they want to be speaking more. What are some actions that they could take? Maybe even an action today that can get them started on the road to speaking more. I would say, you know, we've we, first of all, we've kind of talked about it. The basis of everything that you're going to do is probably going to start with video work. You know, um, I mean, I have a little setup that's basically uh, up up 24 seven with a um, tripod and then a one of the little clip on things for my phone and a Rode microphone, uh, Rode Smart Lav. It's called, it's a lavalier microphone. I think in this world that we live in, um, you know, if you're going to shoot video light and sound, um, as, uh, tactics are, are something you just want to have set up, want to be ready to roll on and, and start shooting little two, three minute, uh, value add videos that you, that you put on Facebook, put on, you know, Twitter, Instagram, what, whatever it is you use is your social, you know, getting value out that out there, I should say, uh, via that model of, uh, of, of video is, is the place to really start. And, um, then you're, you know, you're, you'll get asked to come and speak or getting out and offering your, yourself to speak maybe for free in the beginning. Um, if you're asked to speak, uh, I would normally say, you know, charge a fee for that. Uh, but if you're just trying to get started, just do it for free. Fantastic. I love that we can actually, you know, somebody could be listening to this right now and go do that right yep. now, set it up. And we'll include in the show notes, all those links to those fantastic, uh, just pieces of equipment, um, which, you know, yep. I, I 
set up stuff like that before and it's not very expensive to set something no. up like that. No, no, no. For a hundred dollars, you can have everything. Joe, I want other people to be able to learn more from you. And I, cause I know that I know you've got more tools on in your tool belt and you've got so much more to be able to give. Um, how can we reach you? You know, the best way probably is just Joe at joewilliamsonline.com. Joe at joewilliamsonline.com. Um, if, I mean, you know, I'll, I'll make this, uh, this offer for anybody who's, uh, on your, uh, listening to your show is, you know, shoot me a video there and I'll, I'll send you three, four, five minutes of feedback, um, of what you you know, what, what you can build on, what are your strengths? What can you really work with? And then what are some rough edges you may want to polish off? And, um, I'd be more than happy to do that for anybody who wants to send it. Wow, man, Joe, that is, that's fantastic. And guys, you really got to take advantage of this because uh, your, your critique, your information is gold and everybody definitely take advantage of that and go visit Joe. Uh, I really, really appreciate you coming on sharing so much knowledge. Uh, anything else you want to say? And I can let you go. <laughs> Get out, do it, share your gifts, uh, share your magic with the world. And, uh, and, and as you have said several times, Stay out of yourself, focusing on yourself and focus on uh, those you are serving and you'll find your way. And I just can't thank you enough for sharing so much. So uh, thank you again. And we will hear from you soon. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks for having me on, man. If you guys enjoyed the show and learned something of value, the one ask that we have is please go subscribe. If you'd like to leave us a five-star rating and review, that definitely helps us get our message out there. Because each week, I'm going to interview amazing people. And I want to be able to give you more and more tools and strategies that get you real results. Feel free to connect with me on Facebook or Instagram at Corey Corpodian, or just visit the website at UnleashSuccess.com. Remember, knowing is not enough. Knowledge alone is not power. Action is. Because action is the only way to get the results you want in life and truly live the life of your dreams. So go take some action, subscribe to the podcast, and get ready to unleash success in you.